Caesar. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Good to go? Yeah. Good to go? Has anybody seen a purple brim mark on here? <clears throat> I want to begin uh, this session, first of all, by thank thanking everybody for their flexibility to do a little uh, rearranging of the schedule. Uh, beach, beach Patrol, how is everything? Sandy. Awesome. Sandy. 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 We have more beach people coming Salty, from the showers. Windy. And more coming from the showers, okay. How was the surf? Very rough. Oh, red. <laughs> It was code red out there. We got beat down by those waves. Oh my God. And I didn't even know. Code red. Probably that hurricane that was off the coast was probably coming up causing some. We said we felt like the four horsemen of the Apocalypse were coming down on us and we were like, bring it on! <laughs> <laughs> ah, you're thinking like a surfer, that's good. Um, or you could just wave to them. <laughs> you really you didn't feel like you could be that non But we're really, we're really delighted that um, uh, we could uh, get as much of the circle as possible together. So that's great. Um, and secondly, I want to say uh, thanks to each and every one of you who have been so warm, and you're welcome to me as a uh, West Coaster um, coming to be with you. It's it's just so wonderful to feel at home among among you, and so thank you for the grace and the friendship. It means Come again. means a lot to me. Um, <clears throat> throughout the the first half of this um, particular presentation, I was tending to show more classic religious iconography, particularly from the medieval time, because um, that reminds us that. Uh, the Christian imagination has long been uh, working with with these apocalyptic images. Um, this image, on the other hand, is from a contemporary graphic artist uh, who's not religious at all, and yet drawing on these deep biblical uh, iconography. Uh, and and any of you who are f familiar with graphic novels or contemporary graphic stuff will know that. You know, this stuff's all over the place. And, and I think that says something about the contemporary moment, and that, in fact, is what we're going to spend this afternoon <clears throat> reflecting on um, to understand how the present is rooted in the past and also to understand how the present is a repetition compulsion of the past and to, above all, try to learn the lessons of how we deepen and broaden our uh, resistance and our healing. Um, I'm going to uh, show a rapid succession of charts and graphs, um, and I want to be clear, I do not believe that statistics have the power to move hearts and minds. I don't, and I, I don't imagine you do either. Nor do I imagine that any of these charts are particularly news to you. They're just snapshots capturing bits and pieces rather abstractly of the current landscape um, with which uh, you are already familiar. Um, but like John the Revelator, or Martin of Burning, Birmingham, we have to keep peering into history, especially the history that swirls around us and within us, even when that's painful history, even when that's depressing history, even when that's potentially paralyzing history, um, <clears throat> so that we can be about the work to which we've been called. Um, I'm not going to belabor uh, the, the current landscape um, that the red that the red horseman um, trods upon, because this of all circles um, is keenly aware. Um, the red horse, uh, the the sovereignty of the red horse, is. Uh, galloped around the world. It is more entrenched no matter how we measure it, right? No matter what vector we measure it by, whether we measure it by 
horizontal proliferation, um, particularly in the case of uh, the uh, worst kept secrets, such as Israel's nuclear stockpile, um, or whether we measure it by military budgets, um, <clears throat> which have gone steadily up, um, spiking with each war, hot or cold. Um, and by the way, this is a DOD chart. Um, uh, it's whether we measure it by uh, the militarization of the economy or the international arms trade, um, of which the US now counts for well over half of the world's military spending and capacity. Um, whether we measure it by US foreign interventions, covert or overt, um, or whether we measure it by the sophistication of the technology, ABC, um, micro, nanotechnology, weapon, weaponizing of all of that, uh, drones, right? Uh, you name it. All of these indexes over the last 50 years have expanded uh, enough to make us feel like, uh, like it's hard to, to go on sometimes. Um, and that's why it is very important in circles like this for us to um, commemorate um, this history, to never forget, um, to always be bringing it to mind in a culture that wants to deny, deny, deny. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I, I imagine that all the time a lot of us are taking stock as we reflect on these matters. It, you know, this last uh, August 6th and 9th, 70 years, Art, to even say that, say that number. Um, it's, it's just, uh, uh, it's, it's numbing. Um, 70 years we've been dealing with this particular expression of the nightmare of the red horse. Um, but also why it's so terribly important that we commemorate the acts of faithful resistance, the defections, um, the disarmament, um, however uh, modest and momentary. Uh, so, and, and I know this circle is very mindful. Art, you brought up the uh, anniversary, um, the anniversary you were naming yesterday. Um, the Thames River Plowshares. Thames River uh, Plowshares, and of course, coming up is the 35th. Uh, anniversary of the Plowshares 8, uh, and there are probably other uh, commemorations um, swirling about, um, as well as actions being planned to continue that resistance. Um, so I want to name it. Um, this is the business of this circle in many ways, um, and that is to be honored and embraced. Uh, let me just pause there and um, see if there's anything anyone, anybody wants to say about, um, particularly now, remember that this second half is for our sisters and brothers under 50. Um, if there's anything you want to say about this landscape of the red horse of militarism. Um, again, our friends under 50. bring to mind the atmosphere of living in a relatively small town. We have like 30,000 residents in Ithaca and another 30,000 college students. It's not a very big place um, in a mostly rural landscape and yet we have a really beefy police force and they drive around in unmarked black fast cars all the time. And it's sort of like being in a movie that a lot of people 
my age like to watch when we were like in high school. It was like it's like high techy military cop movies, but we're like living it now. It's just like everywhere, and that's being so normalized. Not even to mention how that policing is experienced by people of color and poor people in my community. Just as me, who doesn't get policed by those people who just walk into the farmer's market with my basket, it's chilling just to see the cars go by, let alone what they're actually doing to human beings when they get out of their cars. So this is a, a great example of the intersectionality, in this case, of the red horse and the black horse, is the, the issue around the country, and indeed around the world, of the militarization of civil policing. Uh, and the weaponizing of, uh, of domestic police peacekeeping forces. So that's, that's, a, that's a real point of connection, one that our movement has to get and, and, uh, and be about. So that's a great, thank you, Leah, that's a, that's a great issue. Thank you back with Leah on uh, the we're, we're giving We're giving priority here, brother, to the right, under 50s. Right. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold us to it. Yeah, I'm going to hold us to it. Not, not that I'm the omniscient judge of age or anything, so I, I don't really necessarily know, but. Certainly one of the issues for the rising generation that is relatively new to us old farts is the phenomenon of drones and, and un, unpersoned you know, military attack. What what that does, not only to the politics of war and the technology of war, but what that does to the classic ethics of war. Mm -hmm. Like it's a whole new ballgame. And, and, and I know many of you have been involved in in drone actions. Just wondering if any of the younger folk want to speak to that. I don't know if folks saw the little news clip the other day about the drone at the U.S. Open, the tennis yeah. tournament. Um, so, yeah, I guess the science teacher like somehow landed a drone in the bleachers. And the tennis player who was playing said, it was really freaky for me because I thought that was it. This is how it ends. Wow. And I thought that was so telling of just like how, you know, people of all ages really um, are in this mindset that, oh, there's a, there's a duffel bag on the sidewalk and I don't know what it is. It's probably a bomb and I'm probably going to die. Like all those sorts of assumptions that we live with every day and coming from a, a person who spent a lot of time in DC, I can definitely say, you know, that's a very much all of our, uh, many people's mindset in, in a lot of places in our country now. They charged that man with reckless endangerment. I like the language. it's really important that we hear each other across across our different experiences and there are things that our younger activists see that that some of us don't see again i i honor this circle as a circle that is deeply sophisticated in, in this sort of stuff yes a little louder. It's, it's really interesting for me, and I'm sure for Katarina as well, like, like coming from the Midwest, like we have, a, I think, a different geographical mindset in addition to the, the general generational differences because, like, we, I think we do experience kind of the same mindset of, like, oh, there's a duffel bag on the, like, on the sidewalk or whatever, like, I could die from that, like, but there's, a, it, like, that's, that's paired or juxtaposed with this idea of, like, oh, that could never happen to me. So we, like, kind of, like, like in the mess have, Midwest have this very, like, insulated, mindset where like there's all these things going on everywhere else in the world but it could never happen to us yeah. mm -hmm. and like there's always that possibility that it could happen to us but like it's never a very realistic possibility so I think a lot of a lot of people in in my generation like from where I'm at um, definitely have that idea of like oh, it, it wouldn't happen to me and I think that speaks a lot to like just like the the atmosphere of privilege that I grew up in I guess yeah. um, but just geographic differences as well. And then Ferguson happened. Exactly. Right? And that, that brings us to that 
second triplet, that black horseman. Um, here's just a particularly dramatic graphic representation of the growth in income inequality in the U.S. since the 1960s, which we were talking about in the morning, the decade of Martin and Malcolm and Watts. Um, it says sort of everything we need to know about um, the fact of racialized economic disparity. I don't know if you, you can see that pretty well. Um, sorry? No, no, Hispanic. Oh, yeah. Thank you. African American, oh, Hispanic. Hispanic, right? Um, again, statistics are only abstractions. We see the realities of this every day, both in the city and in the countryside. Um, obviously, all of this is being driven by the concentrating, the hyper concentration of wealth into fewer and fewer hands. This is a particularly interesting graph, I think, because it shows income growth um, in the immediate period following the mortgage meltdown, 2009 to 2011. And um, it shows the income growth <coughs> of the um, bottom 90% in the period 2009 to 2011 was a whopping $59. Um, whereas, so that's an inch high bar, the growth of the top 10% would need a 163 foot tall bar. The growth in income, median income for the top 1% would need an 884 foot bar. And the top 1% of the 1% would need a five mile high bar. Um, the top 1% enjoyed 81% of all increased income. Just over half of those gains <clears throat> went to the top 1% of the 1%. Um, what that breaks down to for those who crunch numbers is the 1% of the 1% um, enjoyed 40% of all income gain in the United States over that period. That is why, obviously, the Occupy movement tried to bring, to press into popular consciousness the debacle of the disparity, which no longer is um, a disparity between middle class and poor so much it is, as it is between the 1% and the rest of us. Uh, and whatever else we think of the Occupy movement, um, to my mind, it made a huge impact um, simply by introducing the language of the 99% and the 1% into popular parlance and consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it kind of snuck it in, like the, the, the dominant media picked it up before it realized it was <laughs> shooting itself in the foot. And then it was kind of out of the bag. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, you know, I'm sure we could have a long debate about Occupy stuff and uh, its predecessors and its, you know, what it means from here and so on and some of some of us participated and some of us didn't, but um, it's certainly zeroed in on, on this part of the narrative, which um, continues to need to, to, need to be um, understood. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just pause for a minute and once again act, ask some of our younger activists um, whether you might have an Occupy story or um, Opinion or vignette under 50 folk. And again, I'm not assuming that only young people were part of Occupy. I'm just, again, trying to equal the air, air time. Yes. Um, I went to the Occupy Philly. Can you speak up? Yes, please? thank you. Yeah. I didn't go to New York, but I went to Occupy Philly. And it was the first time I really saw a decent coalition between activists and homeless people because the Occupy Philly group focused on wealth redistributing, but they also included homeless people because they did it in the center of the city, and that's where all the homeless people like live. And it really made me happy because I, it's hard to organize homeless people, and I really saw like a nice coalition there. So. And that, that was not just in Philadelphia, that flourished for a short time around the country, and then 
a lot of stuff went wrong. But it, there were some really amazing moments um, in that period in terms of that particular coalition. Um, I'm 48. Go ahead. <laughs> So we live in the Bronx, and um, like many neighborhoods, the Bronx is very uh, low income and people of color. And we do a lot, and I work at a community center there, and we do community organizing there. And what struck me about, and then Occupy, really, the Occupy in New York was happening right near Wall Street, which is physically kind of far from the Bronx. And I loved going. I loved the energy there. We had such a great time. We distributed papers. And I felt really comfortable in that space. And I thought it was really interesting that the, the activists that I worked with in the Bronx, the people of color that worked a lot on neighborhood organizing in the Bronx, like, and really it was the same issue. It was, it's inequity. But it was really hard. It was both the physical distance, I think, but also it was not there. It was not the language of the people of the Bronx. It wasn't the it wasn't the way that they understood the problem, and it wasn't the way that they understood the solution. And it was really interesting to have the conversation. One day we just got on. We rented a bus in the Bronx, and we took a whole bunch of people that do activism in the Bronx down there. And we use the people's might, and everybody got to tell their story of what it's like just to really be poor and really have that particular boot on your neck. And the fact that there was no, we never talk like that in the Bronx. We talk a lot about what it is, but never to people, because that's a lot, of, there were a lot of white <laughs> people there, a lot of um, young people there, and it was. I just thought it was very interesting that not only did it kind of take the veil off of the, the system, but for me it really took a veil off of the, um, the divide between um, different forms of activism, like kind of, I don't want to call it white activism, or, but sort of the thinking about the inequity for people that live in the Bronx versus people that were part of Occupy when we were, were down there. It's just interesting for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's real. That's real. And, and I think it, it's fair to say that <clears throat> for some of the older activists, particularly in circles like this, it was a bit puzzling when you'd hear from Occupy activists, you know, for the first time we're really occupying public space. And we're like, oh yeah, placing your bodies in public space for political reasons. Yeah. <laughs> No one yeah. ever did that before. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it testifies to that generational balkanization of, of resistance culture and how sometimes you have to keep rediscovering the insights and re-embodying them in different ways. Yeah. Well, you, you know, when you're talking about racialized poverty uh, and all the, the issues related, um, <clears throat> You, you, you can't talk at that, about that without being intersectional. And uh, part of the economic picture, right, is the finite resources. This was all very much at play in the movie this afternoon. Um, uh, Cowspiracy, uh, that there's a finite amount of resources. And this is just a real simple way of telling the story that really from about 1986, in terms of those who calculate economic and ecological footprints, the aggregate human extraction of resources from the Earth has surpassed the ability of the Earth to regenerate, whether that's soil fertility or um, fisheries uh, or forests <coughs> or ozone um, across all these ind indices. Um, we essentially now are in what is called ecological debt um, generated by economic overproduction and overconsumption. Um, it's, plant, it, it's estimated that we're now, um, our actual usage of the Earth's bioproductive capacity is in about a 25% overshoot of what the Earth is capable of. Um, 
So we're rapidly liquidating nature, um, and that's clearly unsustainable. Liz? I can't read that first date up there. I would appreciate knowing that. Uh, it's, it's 1961 to 2001. And, and, and so that's the line of, mm -hmm. like, we're using 1.3 Earths now. Um, I mean, you, you don't actually have to have a high school degree to understand that the math of this doesn't doesn't work out. And, and of course, yeah. yeah. I did a little like calculate this for yourself thing at school, and just by living in the United States, you automatically use more than one planet. Yeah. Just by nature of the fact that you're in, in the United States. Right, so the disparity is, is um, it's unsustainable in the aggregate, but it's also unevenly distributed around the globe. Exactly. Uh, and, and because um, we are over extracting, um, and because the nature of imperial um, economy is capitalist, um, that means that competition for increasingly scarce resources is going to get meaner and meaner and already is. Um, some of you um, tackled this, this uh, book, one of Michael Clare's recent book. Michael, of course, is legendary among us for being an articulator of militarism, um, but in recent years um, has really been turning his considerable analytical con uh, attention toward this business of resource wars, um, which is about both mapping what, res what kind of competition for what kind of resources uh, is going to demand what sort of deployments of, of military and foreign policy. Some of you familiar with, with Michael Clare's work? Uh, it's very, very important. Um, and as, as he puts it, um, as the race for what's left, as he calls it, gains momentum, predatory behavior will become more frequent and more brutal. Uh, and of course, it's again important for us to remind ourselves that this is already true globally. Ask people in Nigeria, or in Colombia, or in East Timor, or in the highlands of the Philippines. Um, whether it's logging, or strategic mineral extraction, or mining. Um, but it's also becoming more so domestically. Witness the tar sands um, in uh, northern Canada. Fracking, right? Driving deeper, um, more ab absurd energy expenditure for energy extraction. Um, so <clears throat> all of this is happening on the back of the black horse. Um, but we haven't even yet spoke of an issue that really is igniting the imagination of the rising generation of activists, which is understanding the ra racialized economic disparity through the lens of the prison industrial complex, which many in this room know from the inside out. Um, this is a system of human warehousing based not only on race, but also on fundamental economic disparity. Poor people are planned to fill prison beds, and prison privatization generates profits. Um, again, this kind of tells us everything we need to know about the black horsemen of the apocalypse. And um, I consider it, um, Claire, you might uh, agree with me, this is one of the really important movements to demand our attention um, as peace and justice people. And uh, <clears throat> I want to um, remind us um, as I alluded to this, this morning, Watts 1965 was not the last time my city would burn. And Apocalypse 2.0 in Los Angeles, see if you've heard this one before, started with a routine traffic stop of a black man by white police who pulled him out, jacked him up, beat him down. This time, this time was 1992, it was caught on video. Not an iPhone video, but somebody with a video camera, and of course that became the famous, um, what's often called Rodney King case, as if Rodney King was on trial. 
um, which was actually the <clears throat> the uh, trial of four white police officers. Now, what's particularly poignant, I think, um, about this intermediate history, meaning the history sort of halfway between now and Watts, is that um, when this tape started circulating immediately on media, folks didn't riot. Talk about the patience of people hoping for justice. It was only at the acquittal of the four white police officers by an all-white jury in a white suburb, a remote white suburb, suburb of L.A. County, it's only upon the reading of that verdict that shit went down. And this time I wasn't 12. This time I was right in the middle of it. Uh, and I remember being in a room of African-American activists hearing this verdict come down in real time. And, um, and that, that was an apocalyptic moment um, when not only was the tension in the room pretty thick, but we all had to pull it together real fast because we knew what was going to go down and we know, knew we had to figure out how, do you, how are you peacemakers in now in the middle of this storm to come. And I remember Renee Dyson, one of my teachers, she got up, she said, excuse me for a minute, I got to go beat the shit out of something. And she went in the closet, boom, 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 we could hear it for about five minutes. She came back in, sat down, said, let's get, a, let's get to work. Just one of the most amazing moments in which as, as active local neighborhood activists, we went out on the streets to try to keep peace, knowing what was to come and what in fact did come. Um, put together some, some little yellow hats and little yellow vests in, in LA and got out on the streets and I'm on my way out there like, uh-uh. No, you, you stay here and staff the phones, dude. <clears throat> I'm like, oh, okay. And I, you know, I, I did go out and learned very quickly why that probably wasn't a good idea. Just, just one of, in my own biography, one of the really apocalyptic, revealing moments. Um, and <clears throat> um, that reactive violence, for the second time in my life in my city. Um, the percolating rage boiled over. You know, a year before this, I had gone to the 25th, two years before this, I had gone to the 25th commemoration of the Watts uprising that was done, uh, that was put on by Watts activists. And we all went, went down there, and it was a really interesting forum. And who was there at the forum? Sweet Alice Harris. Remember I mentioned her name? Uh, who was part of the, the Watts stuff? And Sweet Alice, you know, all these academics who were writing papers on Watts, 1965, and talking about their analysis, and showing charts and graphs, and doing what white people do. And then Sweet Alice says, she gets up, she says, you done yet? <laughs> and then she just stands up and she said, I told you, in 65, the cup of oppression had just been filling up and filling up and filling up, and it just overflowed. Right? That would be the Bronx analysis. And then she stops and she gave, gave the stare. And she says, and it's filling up again. And it's about to overflow. And 18 months later, it did. Um, really, as I mentioned, one of the defining experiences, talk about the end of the world. Um, <clears throat> the largest civil disturbance in US history. Uh, just as Watts had given the nation the slogan, burn, baby, burn, so the no justice, no peace slogan came up out of the fires of Los Angeles in 1992. Um, echoing Dr. King's dictum, one of the great local African-American leaders in Los Angeles, Reverend Chip Murray, said this, the LA riots were America's wake-up call. A wake-up call is loud, insistent, annoying, and often belligerent, especially to people who are asleep. You just can't say it any clearer than that, and yet folks slept on. And I am very mindful that we're coming up on um, <clears throat> 25 years since that happened 
instead of indicting the system that makes this kind of violence inevitable, instead of unmasking a deeply divided racialized social system, instead low-income blacks and Latinos were scapegoated. You know the story, the same in your city. In the wake of the uprising came tougher policing, more racial profiling, gang injunctions, draconian sentencing guidelines, and then renewed flight to the suburbs by those who could afford it further furthering the economic hollowing out of the affected neighborhoods. You see, while the red horseman threatens to end the world in, the, in an instant, this horseman, this horseman slowly and relentlessly destroys whole communities and then torches them and then walks away to return again. In other words, the LA uprising was the apocalypse for that place, for those neighborhoods, right now. I was there, it was apocalyptic. And many of you can testify to the same thing um, as recently as Ferguson or Baltimore or New York. <clears throat> From 1965 to 1992 to today, speaking of commemorations, in the last two months we've commemorated the one-year anniversary of the death of Eric Garner and Michael Brown in Ferguson. So-called routine arrests that ended in death. And the bad news keeps coming in. From Sandra Bland to the murder of Jason Jamal Warren in Los Angeles just two days ago. It's relentless. It's relentless. And it follows inevitably on the back of this horse. And just parenthetically, uh, just parenthetically, um, it's, it's hard to track all of this that's going on. Um, if, if you have the backbone and the attention and the courage, I encourage you to bookmark um, the website that has been put up by the Spirit House Project called Breaking the Silence, a phrase from the Beyond Vietnam speech, uh, Breaking the Silence Against Modern Day Lynching. It's a Facebook group page, and they are documenting every single case they can find of people of color, male and female, in every part of this country um, <clears throat> who are experiencing um, violence, sexual violation, um, murder, uh, death in custody um, at the hands of law enforcement. And, and I'm telling you folks, just, just to, it, take a week and go to that Facebook page every day that week. They're posting seven, eight, 12 times a day different cases of this. And that's important because we forever want to say this is exceptional, this is particularly bad, it's not always like that. It is always like that for some sectors of our communities. And um, I just want to shout out to Ruby, friend, I know, good friends with Liz and many others in this circle. She and her compañeras have just done, to me it's heroic work because of the toll it takes. Especially on somebody like Ruby, who 50 years ago, two weeks ago, herself survived an extra judicial judicial execution because of a young Episcopal seminarian who stood, who moved in front of her and took the bullet in Alabama in 1965. We just celebrated that commemoration two weeks ago, Jonathan Daniels. And Ruby's lived with that. And she is a woman on a mission. Um, she is a sister in the faith. She's a warrior. And pay attention to, if nothing else, track this. Because it is it is part of the part of the business end of the Black Horseman. Say her name is the slogan, as you know, now in the Black Lives Matter movement. People who have put up with being able to be killed in custody, killed on the street, 
simply because nobody paid attention. The movement now is about saying their names publicly, over and over, over and over. Never forget, never forget. Um, <clears throat> because in it's, a, it's an apocalypse happening right now, every day, on the streets of this country. Um, parenthetically, um, using the metaphor of the horseman, I had the good or bad fortune of being in Israel-Palestine with Palestinian activists, as, as many of you, I think, have, have experienced. Um, a few years ago, um, on Land Day, March 30th, Land Day is a day of public demonstration of Palestinians against the occupation all over the West Bank, Gaza, and it's always a pretty hairy time. And uh, <clears throat> I was invited by some Palestinian activists to go uh, be part of the demonstration in East Jerusalem, right across from the Damascus Gate of the Old City. And I thought, yeah, okay, this ought to be pretty interesting. And um, after we got through the checkpoint at Bethlehem, which was hairy enough in itself and, and got there, started out peaceful uh, uh, demonstration, Palestinians, mothers holding pictures of slain sons and fathers and husbands. Um, here comes uh, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, right on schedule, um, right after, this was a Friday, right after Mosque had let out, and they came on horseback. And uh, unlike many of you, I'm not a military veteran, so I don't have a lot of experience um, with different kinds of military strategies, like right in your face. But I'm telling you, big ass horses with, with heavy, heavily armored soldiers, not police, on the back of horses, wading into a crowd in narrow alleys in East Jerusalem, everybody fleeing for their lives because you can get killed by a gun and you get killed by a horse. And the horse hooves are particularly geared to smashing people. That's the scariest thing I've ever experienced existentially. That's the black horse of militarism and, and that really brought home the horse metaphor to me. Um, so, Can I just say something there because who was, was anyone in, in New York when can't remember what the demo was, and the police came on horses. Wall, Wall Street. Wall Street. Yeah. Wall Street. And it was the scariest they went thing right I have ever yeah, I was had there. to experience. Yeah. You know, the concussion grenades, and the, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's street skirmishing. And one of the things that the anti-globalization movement had to learn, and it was a hard lesson, is, yeah, street, street skirmishing, that's badass. And they'll beat us every single time because they're way better than, than we are at street skirmishing. Um, you know, I'm talking about the black bloc anarchists and all that stuff that was pretty popular 10, 15 years ago and still is an issue in, in protests today. Um, and, and rightly rightly so, it's already been named in this circle, but you know that, that moment in Charleston. I, I sent out a blog. Um, uh, Bill sent it out, uh, a link to a blog. Um, you know, the very same day that this shooting happened in Mother Emanuel in Charleston, a historic African-American congregation that had been the heartbeat of um, abolitionist work way back to the 1820s, um, in which Christopher Vesey, um, an early black anti-slavery activists um, organized a slave result, uh, revolt by preaching every Sunday at Mother Emanuel in 1819 and 1820. And when the white authorities found out about it, arrested 35 members of uh, Emanuel AME Church, executed them, including Emanuel Vesey, and burned that church to the ground. And that church membership went underground for the next 45 years, until after the Civil War. That church was violated by a young white supremacist breathing the air of the myth of the Confederacy. That same day, 
Israeli hypernationalists walked into the church of the loaves and fishes in Tabgha, Israel, on the Sea of Galilee, the traditional site where Jesus broke the loaves and fishes. A church that also has a history of being burned down by Israeli settlers. And they walked into that Franciscan parish and they burned it down again, same day. It was also the day that the Pope released the encyclical on the environment. Laudate Si. It's a hell of a day. Desi's name is actually Denmark. De what did I say, Christopher? Yes. I had to think about it. Thank you. Yeah. Denmark Vesey. You're right. Thank you. Um, this, of course, was a particularly <coughs> odious expression of white violence. <laughs> precisely because it violated the one safe space traditionally in, in American society for black people, which is the black church. Uh, and to have a young white man walk in as if he were a seeker of the gospel and sit down and participate for an hour in a Bible study and then pull out a gun, that's... That's white supremacy roaring out of the political unconscious of America through this young, clueless, unemployed 19-year-old. And that has brought us now to this moment in which um, we have to reckon with a new apocalyptic unmasking. How could it possibly be a, rev a revelation that black lives matter? And yet, here it is. So much so that even in some of our circles, we're not quite sure. We feel totally comfortable with saying that. Like, we don't get it. Well, all lives matter. So, so there's a lot of anger, a lot of rage, and again, I want to open it up to to any of the younger activists who maybe have had some, you know, uh, working with some of this on, on, the, on the ground. Um, I was part of a really interesting intergenerational dialogue between African American elders and young Black Lives Matter activists, civil rights veterans, including people like Ruby Sales and Nelson Johnson, listening to these young Black Lives Matter activists who were just angry, but mobilized. And um, I'm just wondering what's percolating among some of the younger folk around this. There is a lot of organizing going on. A lot of organizing. Most of it's not coming from places with which we are familiar. Well, we have at Free Ghost Public School in New York City, and she just started a 6 through uh, 12 school. So it's like middle school and high school together. And um, I want to say it was as a response to the Earl Garner. At any rate, the, the, the young people in the school were doing two things. They started talking about their experience as being young men, mostly, but people, kids of color, and their experience with the police and what that meant to them and, and how a negative, how they all, many of the kids in the school had been stopped and frisked and had, and they wanted to organize so that She's in a really good school, and the teachers were organizing with the students to walk out of school, um, uh, walk over the um, bridge into Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Bridge, and then there was, I can't remember the public, there was a public office there that they thought that they wanted to petition to do something. I can't remember exactly what, but it was good because it was a, they had chosen some, they thought that they could change something about the system, that they were angry and that the teachers were helping them to redirect their just pure anger into this thing that they thought they could do. And, and, 
and they sent home the flyers and everybody was ready to go. And then the Department of Education called the principal and said, we'll fire you if you do it. And the principal then held a special meeting with the parents. And I have to say to his credit, he said, I can't sanction it. But I believe that the students in this school are going to walk out. And I believe that their teachers will not let them walk out alone. And so I just want awesome. you to know that wow. your child will wow. be safe. I'm not tell I'm not sanctioning it. And it was a really interesting what kind of interesting, wasn't it, Frida? Because we had a lot so it gave us a real chance to talk about with other, her other classmates and with each other about that. We she was in sixth and it was a really rainy day. So not walk out ultimately, but we were happy to know that so many of her, of the classmates were in that were really lucky to be in a school that is talking about it and helping the young, all the young people, both to talk about race, to talk about police brutality, to talk about ways to move forward, and they do it through club. They have like a club, but also they integrate it into the school. It was, You see, we've, we've seen the movie of Watts before, and it keeps happening. But we've also seen that movie before. Because the same thing happened during the Children's March in Birmingham in 1963. When the DJ got on the radio and spoke code to the, to the kids in school, saying, okay, you know, when this song plays, it's time to get out into the streets. And the principals, the teachers said, we're not sanctioning it, but the doors are open. And... And that brings up also another really interesting piece about what's happening, which is a whole new generation of badass activism and nonviolent civil disobedience. And uh, <clears throat> I'm telling you, uh, this woman, Bree Newsom, and her compañeras, or the people she acted with, um, th these are some powerful, powerful young people. Uh, Bree's from Charlotte. Uh, and. Uh, and this is the rising generation. And this is a faith-based activist right here. She said, in the name of Jesus, this flag has got to come down. Now, folks, that wasn't just a courageous action for any young person, much less a woman. But in South Carolina, as a black woman, to get up on that pole and take down a Confederate flag, uh, what we saw in South Carolina in the space of about six weeks were two completely unprecedented um, moments. The Charleston Church as an unprecedented mo moment of violation. Of course, that movie had been played before in Birmingham, 16th Street Baptist Church. And, and uh, honestly, an unprecedentedly bold public action um, by an African American. Uh, she was, as you know, reciting Psalm 23 as she was brought down off that pole and arrested. <laughs> you better believe she was citing Psalm 23 when you're about to go into white custody after doing that. And yet that action has broken up so much political imagination throughout the South that suddenly little chambers of commerce in little towns across the South are rethinking the stars and bars. I mean, that's, that's the power. If, if the horror of the apocalypse is, is almost unimaginable, the power that, that comes from this sort of courageous, nonviolent direct action. And it didn't come from any of us, friends. Um, and, and that is what it is. But that's an invitation for us to be about building some new alliances. Because there's some courageous courageous stuff rising and we have a lot to give and to teach and we have some stuff to learn it seems to me about how we resist this black horse I want to open up a little uh, more space before we move to the final horseman anybody please well, uh, a week or two ago um, in my area the local TV station was doing a section nearby, and the cameraman and the news reporter were shot. Yeah. Um, and so my area has been grieving over that a lot. 
and lots of sadness, but I know, as was shown earlier, is there's been a lot of that in black poor communities all over the nation that's been happening for such a long time. And this was a huge deal where we lived. And yet, I know that when the Baltimore riots were happening, people just didn't understand why people would do that. <coughs> why they would go angry and smash things of people who had never hurt them. And seeing how this felt in my community when just only two people had been killed. And it wasn't by a police officer, it wasn't by anyone of authority. And just how upset people were. It really got me thinking, you know, it's really, I see why they would do that. I see why people would go out and smash and burn for so much loss. Thank you. Well said. <coughs> I remember um, the night that my uncle Peter died in an accident, and I was in the airport on my way to um, where my cousin Kate was, and I remember being on the phone with my boyfriend Ira, and I wasn't able to hang up the phone. I had like a five hour uh, layover before I could get on my next plane. And I had never experienced that kind of grief and trauma before. I could hardly move. And I remember just needing to have him on the phone and saying to him, oh my God, how can we put other people through this intentionally every day? Like I just couldn't, all of a sudden I was realized, like I had never experienced that and to experience it and realize that like I had to be driven across the airport I couldn't walk down the hallway they had to like drive me on one of those little carts and my uncle like lived with us at home and everything was wonderful and fine in our lives and he died in an accident nobody intentionally killed him and I couldn't even and I guess I need to remember that moment more often but it came so clearly to me and I just asked him how do we do, how do we intentionally inflict this on people? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that, Jackson. Because when you have any little personal way of understanding the horror and grief, I think it's a really important connection and way to wake up. I don't know if uh, particularly any of you younger people um, saw this, but it was kind of a big thing about a month ago. Um, a young uh, Jewish American artist did a depiction of Brie Newsom taking down the flag, depicting her as Wonder Woman. Yes. Awesome. So good. Awesome. Uh, and, you know, this is a circle that understands the power of nonviolent symbolic direct action, right? Right there, right there, an historic moment that we're, we're commemorating 35 years of a historic moment of doing something that had never been done in that way before to try to break open the moral and political imagination of America in denial and in lockdown. And I want to submit that this was that kind of action. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> and it, it was a disarmament action, friends. Yeah. That's I am, okay. I am Go ahead. two years old with this. <laughs> we'll grandfather you in. Listen, <laughs> <laughs> that's a slippery slope. <laughs> I, no, I, I mean, struck by it because it's it's just a, a, a theme that keeps running through, uh, or I, that keeps coming up for me as people are, are speaking, and that is her action reminded me, you know, I don't know Bree, I don't know the community that she lives in, but hearing her recite that psalm as she came down that pole, it was, it, I got goosebumps all over my body, and I just was like, whoa. And, and I, it just, what, what the, the, so the theme that, that's coming up for me is, obviously she's been steeped in something, you know, powerful, to know that, that, the, that, um, that our faith can move us in these ways that can, these profound things can happen. And it made me think of the story of the, of the Les Chambon community in France. Mm -hmm. And, and it's this, 
this thing of what do we nurture ourselves with and what are we steeping ourselves in and uh, and that when we do that this kind of thing can happen in such an organic way right. and I mean I don't know her whole story I only heard her on democracy now a little bit but um, but I just feel like that there's that thing of like what how are we nurturing ourselves how are we nurturing our children how are we what are we uh, how are we understanding this gospel and this faith that we have so anyway mm. yeah. And what about the pale horse? <clears throat> Let me just say, friends, um, <clears throat> we are living in a moment of opportunity. Some stuff has really been unmasked this summer. Again, let us not miss the opportunity. Um, go find a, an inter interview in print or in media with Bree or with some of the people in Ferguson. Just listen. Uh, or. Go talk to some of the local folk doing this work where you are. Go pay a pastoral visit to a local AME church. Just, just because. Just show up. Show up to a Sunday service and maybe say this to somebody. Just wanted to say that we see you. We feel this pain. We are with you. These are some opportunities that can help us um, deep in our own work. Um, and <clears throat> of course we have to talk about this. Um, this is the one that G neither John the Revelator nor Dr. King could have envisioned. None of us really. An ecological apocalypse. What has changed since the oil spills in Santa Barbara Channel of 1969 and the one that happened just this spring? is that oil extraction and pipelines and spills are now massively greater in scale, as is every aspect of extraction. Um, I'm really glad that we had the, the um, Cowspiracy film to show other aspects of, um, that are contributing to climate catastrophe. Um, and we have to keep, keep talking about um, the carbon economy. Uh, which is driving the wholesale destruction of habitats in an ever more intense search for strategic resources going deeper, further, more destructively, typified by the tar sands extraction. Few of us could have foreseen how our oil addiction has led to this newest, possibly last great apocalyptic threat, that of climate catastrophe. Let us not call it climate change. Um, and let's not talk about how we are going to adjust to climate change uh, any more than let us get used to living life under the bomb. This is about resisting these awful horsemen of the apocalypse. Of the three triplets, I think for many of us in this circle, this is one still we're trying to get our minds and hearts around. Um, <clears throat> so here's, here's the basic graph, right, of 350.org, and I, I put it up because I think 350 whatever else we think of it, has done a good job trying to translate scientific narrative into a soundbite that people can um, not only understand but act around. Um, as Bill McKibben puts it, we're in a struggle to prevent the lighting of a carbon fuse that will take us past the point of no return. Um, so just notice, notice the rise of this graph. It is one of the icons of the pale horse of the apocalypse. Paul Kingsnorth is one of the most thoughtful ecological writers in the United Kingdom, and he recently wrote this in The Guardian. Sitting on the desk in front of me is a set of graphs. The horizontal axis of each graph is identical. It represents time from the years 1750 to the present. The graphs show variously human population levels, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, exploitation of fisheries, destruction of tropical forests, paper consumption, number of motor vehicles, water use, rate of species extinction, the totality of gross domestic products of the human economy, and so on. He says, what grips me about these graphs, and graphs don't usually grip me, <laughs> is that though they all show very different things, they all have an almost identical shape. 
The line begins at the left of the page and it rises gradually as it moves to the right. And then in the last inch or so, around the year 1950, it suddenly veers steeply upwards like a pilot banking after a cliff has suddenly appeared. The root causes of all these trends is the same, a rapacious human economy, which is bringing the world swiftly to the brink of chaos. We know this, some of us even attempt to stop it happening, and yet all of these trends continue to get rapidly worse. There is no sign of that changing soon. What Kings North is talking about here is what is now known in, in the, the field as the hockey stick image, right? <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> it's just one way of trying to get our minds and hearts around this. Um, and just to show a few of these graphs um, up close, this is a this is a catalog of, of the increase of different kinds of extreme weather or climate disaster from 1950 to the present. Hockey stick. Um, <clears throat> here is a graph of recent sea level rise. Hockey stick. Here's the EPA's chart of CO2 emissions. And this one is not just of 1900 to the present, but also projected um, over the next 75 years, um, a dramatic illustration of our apparent inability to stop the behavior that is driving us to oblivion. And of course, surface temperature of the planet. Each of these graphs measuring distinct phenomenon, each exhibiting the same pattern noted by Kingsnor. The science is in. It's, it's not a debate. Um, <clears throat> the, the very mainstream scientists now have all arrived at this conclusion. This is um, the Bulletin of a, um, American Meteorology, so Meteorological Society, um, who were mandated by Congress way back in 1992 to give an annual report on the uh, state of the climate. They only began to do so in the last 10 years and they're still not able to do it every year because there's so much data to process. These are very mainstream government scientists who are on the, the payroll, right? But this report that issued last year, here's, here's, the, here's the conclusion. Somebody want to read that? In 2014, the most essential indicators of Earth's changing climate continue to reflect trends of a warming planet with several markers such as rising land and o ocean temperature, sea levels, and greenhouse gases setting new records. Here's the same hockey stick over 24 different indices. Too small to read, which is why I showed you some close-ups. But you see the same shape over and over repeatedly. It's almost like Ruby Sales' website. Same shit, same shit, same shit. When is this shit going to stop? Our disastrous reengineering of the planet has invoked a new definition of hubris. I promised to define this term earlier. <clears throat> we are now in the age of the Anthropocene. This is a term coined in the 1980s by ecologist Eugene Sturmer popularized by Nobel Prize winning atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen. It identifies the influence of human behavior on the Earth's atmosphere in recent centuries so significant as to constitute a new geological epoch. When a lot of us in this room were born, we lived in the Holocene era. The Holocene was a geological epoch that began after the last ice age during which planetary temperatures have become ideal for human habitation. From the last end of the last ice age till about the time some of us were born. The Holocene, the planet being hospitable to human life in particular. And we now no longer live in that world. We live in the world of the Anthropocene. 
which means the world re-engineered by human technology and human militarism and human <coughs> madness. Our way of life has been unmasked again as an end game, as Derek Jensen rightly calls it. It's so ironic, isn't it, friends, that our churches, our beloved traditions that have sold the gospel down the river, our churches are embarrassed by the language of apocalyptic. And because our churches have not been naming this, it's up to the scientists to become apocalyptic. And if you're watching the literature over the last 20 years, it's the scientists who are using apocalyptic language, apocalyptic imagery. This is Ed Ayer's famous 2003 book, already dated, called God's Last Offer. The editor of World Watch magazine. Or <clears throat> James Speth. Um, in his book, The Bridge at the End of the World, published in 2008. Somebody want to read this? This is just another way of saying it, uh, of summarizing it. How serious is the threat to the environment? Here is one measure of the problem. All we have to do to destroy the planet's climate and biota and leave a ruined world to our children and our grandchildren is to keep doing exactly what we're doing today. There's no growth in the human population or the world economy. Just continue to release greenhouse gases at the current rates. Just continue to impoverish ecosystems and release toxic chemicals at current rates. And the world in the latter part of the century won't be fit to live in. Um, and here's what he means. This is not rhetorical flourish. Remember, he's a scientist. Um, so there's the scientist trying to speak apocalyptic language, which meant that um, <clears throat> we now live in this ironic moment in which science and religion have finally found <laughs> common ground. <laughs> right? Um, and so that means that theologians are having to start to pay attention to science. And um, one of the most important books, in my opinion, theologically, that's come out in the last few years is Michael Northcutt's A Political Theology of Climate Change, published in 2013. If, you're, if you want to really wrap your head around some very deep, deep analysis of the depth of the pathology of, this, uh, of that which has brought us to this point, this is an amazing book. But he refers to what uh, Jim Spent is calling He's, he's talking about a four degree Celsius warmer planet means. What that means, to bottom line it, is that three quarters of the Earth's land area will be unsuitable for food growing or secure human settlement. Three quarters of the planet unfit as a result of a four degree centigrade rise. Everybody now agrees that even if we stopped now, we'd be looking at a four degree centigrade rise in temperature by the end of this century. Um, there, there's simply no way to overstate this apocalypse. And, and we've been at this for a while in this circle. We, we know so, a little something about these horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then um, Northcutt concludes um, with, with this pretty sobering, and somebody just want to read the lower left quote. On the current trajectory, by the end of the present century, or within the lifetime of our grandchildren, the planet will be a new creation, but not of the making of God or evolution. Yeah. Of course, our prophets have seen this coming. Brother Dan saw it coming, which is why his commentary on Revelation was called the Nightmare of God. Um, <clears throat> the Nightmare of God. This is a nightmare 
from the perspective of the creator. Um, but our task still, again, more than ever, is to how to move hearts and minds. Um, to move hearts and minds in a moment in which um, we can't really even have a reasonable conversation about putting the brakes on in time. We now have to have the conversation about preparing for impact. And of course, it's not us who are feeling it first. Um, which is why I asked Bill to send you um, Naomi Klein's piece on climate change, politics, and Black Lives Matter. Um, and I hope you had a chance to look at that. If you didn't, please commit to doing so. Um, it's a short piece, three or four pages, very, very succinct explanation of why um, <clears throat> this is an issue of racial and economic justice and apocalypse right now, um, in the same way that nuclear weapons development and production and testing were an issue for indigenous people right now, not what might happen if a nuke exploded over London or Washington, but what's happening right now. Similarly, we don't have to be particularly eschatological about um, climate catastrophe. It's already happening right now. There's also amazing resistance <coughs> happening. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you have to hand it in terms of an, an expression of popular protest that's largely been handled through social media in a highly decentral fa decentralized fashion. Um, 350.org has mobilized a lot of people. There's a lot of really important um, stuff happening under uh, and with the transition movement in terms of trying to figure out how we live now. Um, and I want to give a shout out to um, a movement in the Southeast called Gulf South Rising. Um, mostly people of color, mostly poor folk, who um, their slogan is the seas are rising and so are we, um, who are saying, you know, from, uh, from Katrina uh, <clears throat> to um, uh, the, the Gulf oil spill. So this, this year was the 10th anniversary of, of Katrina and the 5th anniversary of the Gulf oil spill. Here are people of color in the lowlands saying, this is not about what might happen, this is about what is happening, join us. Um, this is an, another one of those invitations to us to have the political imagination to face this pale horse. Um, and the last uh, point I, I want to make is. Ted, what's the title of Naomi's article? Uh, what is the title of it? Um, I think I brought a hard copy of it. Um, something about what, why Black Lives Matter for climate change, something like that. Okay. It's one of the links that, that Bill sent us. Yeah, so uh, there were four yeah. documents sent together, and if somebody didn't get them, they could give me their name and email address on yeah. paper. Yeah. If I can get back from them, and then yeah. I will push it back. Thanks. Yeah, mo most of those are links to to our blog, and, and those are optional. Not now McLean's piece is required reading, just because, again, it just crystallizes what we're talking about here. Um, one of the most profoundly spiritual, powerful movements of resistance around these issues happening right now is among indigenous women. All around North America, all around the Americas actually, and in particular the water walking movement in which uh, Ojibwe and Lakota um, and Chumash and Kwakul uh, women and, and women all over the continent are um, <clears throat> are walking water and reclaiming ceremony to rebuild our relationship with water and they're taking water and they're walking around the Great Lakes and doing ceremony all as a form of resistance to water policies um, and indigenous policies in Canada and in the US it's a movement that's spreading it's the movement out of which Idle No More came um, presumably everyone's at least heard about the Idle More no, no More movement one of the most amazing movements of indigenous um, activism that um, 
sort of peaked two years ago, but is still very much bubbling, in which um, Native people occupied um, political space and public space, particularly in Canada, but also in the US, um, took over whole intersections and just did round dances and ceremonies and block traffic, all um, dealing with political issues around indi indigenous sovereignty. There is some amazing spiritually grounded work being done by Native people, and they are waiting for us to join them. They are um, always so happy when Christian folk show up because they actually believe, believe that Christian folk are supposed to get this. <clears throat> A lot of the secular environmental movement is never happy when the Christians show up. <clears throat> but Native women are. And, uh, and we have so much to learn from these folk. And, and finally, um, just by way of remembering that there are moments, several of you named, rightly so, that not only was Thomas Merton a counter voice in the 1960s, but also John the 23rd, who issued one of the most amazing pastoral letters, encyclicals, um, Pachim and Terrace. Um, I don't know, Liz, it's safe to say that many people in this room are the children of Pachim and Terrace, wouldn't it? Uh, you know, this, this sort of gave some language and gave, more importantly, some permission. Um, <clears throat> And isn't it interesting that in the darkest hour of the red horse of the apocalypse, the Cuban Missile Crisis, right on its heels would come this opening of a door. Uh, and so it is no accident that um, on the day that Tabga Church of Loaves and Fishes was torched and on the day when the Charleston Church was violated, um, Laudato Si on the care of our common home was publicized and, and published and what was even more interesting was who was part of the launch um, because part of the launch was an Eastern Orthodox Bishop a signal that this is a, a world encyclical and an atheist scientist we're at the launching of this encyclical. And how many of you have actually read the encyclical? Good. Good. Not the whole thing. You know what? It's a good read. Yeah. Go. I've read the whole thing twice. Wow. Um, it's, it is actually worth reading, and I never thought those words would come out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. but, but it is, it, it, there is so much here, and it's so depthful, and it is so radical, in the same way Pacham and Terrace was. It is giving all kinds of permission, friends, for radical action and radical new practices. And um, in some ways, most importantly, um, it says very explicitly, among other things, this isn't a side issue for the church. This has to be at the center of the gospel right now. So let us take that to heart. And if any of you want to caucus over a meal and talk more about this encyclical. I've got a copy of it here. Um, it's online, available. It's an amazing piece. Uh, we have a giant copy of it. Yeah. A giant copy of it. We made a six foot, seven foot <laughs> copy of it and blocked the gates of the Creston Gas Storage Facility. Nice. So oh anybody can join us next week if they want to do it again. That's good news for me, because I need the big print version. So. I know. <laughs> large type. Large type. Large type. <laughs> it's very large type. Very large type. So again, for, for, for the third and final time, I just want to open it up to some of our younger um, activist friends. Um, you know, this is the issue, um, Leah, of your generation. This is, the, this is the shadow of the apocalypse under which your generation has grown. You, just as so many of us have never known a world that wasn't under the shadow of the mushroom cloud, so your generation has simply not known a world that wasn't under the shadow of the pillaging of the planet and the end game of the Anthropocene. And, um, and so we want to listen to some of the younger folk. What are you feeling? What are you seeing? What are you doing? What are you hoping for? 
big questions, I know, but just a moment to open up some space. Yes, I feel like when I was first interested in the Catholic worker and intentional communities and things of that sort, I feel like there were kind of two paths you could take. I guess it's before the Catholic, I really knew the Catholic worker. That was either like the activism path where you got arrested, you know, if you're only true if you're in prison, or the groups that kind of came out of society and lived off the grid, and then I realized the Catholic workers could do both. I felt like there were kind of these two paths to take. Um, and now I learned that like, you can't, like, the path down the middle perhaps is easier <laughs> than both. But um, that, I think, is it's kind of exciting. We have a book group at our house that Scott and I kind of represent one, the Catholic Workers Fund, the rest are all kind of smaller, intentional farmers in our area. And at first I was like, oh, what's, what, what kind of what's happening with this? <laughs> but I feel like that, the, the discussions coming out of that group are kind of an exciting answer. This idea of kind of living the simple life of living off the grid isn't, or doesn't have to be exclusive of other things. And especially when they're talked about and lived intentionally in a way that that does that. Yet at the same time, I still have a hard time like me living on a farm is helping the Black Lives Matter movement or stopping yeah. a mom in Palestine from a child being dropped by bombs. So I, I just think for me personally in my life, this has kind of been an interesting conversation yeah. of where we are. Thank you. Beautifully put. One of the horsemen of the apocalypse. We must see that they are all deeply related. We must understand their intersexuality, intersectionality, and we must work to integrate our movements of resistance and renewal. Uh, and that is, um, that is part of the new resistance of the Anthropocene. Um, and how, how are we doing on, on dinner and timing? Everything's ready, and some of you have been in the ocean and you're hungry. Um, I want to thank uh, particularly our, our younger activists for talking to us, and uh, I hope that these conversations will continue. Uh, we've, we've done some pretty heavy lifting in these two sessions of mapping both past and present, mapping <coughs> the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the ways in which they intersect, and we have lots more um, conver uh, conversation to, to have, and um, but I want to thank you again um, for listening to each other, and let's keep that intergenerational conversation going. Um, keep the questions, the hard questions, flowing, and realize that um, there's there's a lot of new energy and new imagination rising, and there's a lot of really important wisdom among the veterans. Um, so closing vignette. Um, I loved how you put it about the, the new generation of Catholic workers. Um, most of our work that we do now is with people under 35. And it's, um, it's awesome. And, and so we, we see a lot of these, these young folks and see how they're coming to the Catholic worker movement and encountering the Catholic worker movement and the questions they're bringing and the tradition they're encountering. Um, but they're bring, you know, they're bringing their own rage and they're bringing their own anomie. And uh, perhaps like others of you in the room, I've had more than a few conversations with with young folk coming to the movement. You know, coming out of an anarchist uh, uh, conviction, and what they really want to talk about is should we blow up dams? Mm -hmm. And and that is that is a serious question. And they're they're. They're coming to people like us. Well, we've had that conversation before, right? That's not a new question in terms of resistance to the apocalypse. Um, and there's a little bit of wisdom to offer. Um, they want to know about doing stuff and, and living underground. Well, there, that's not a new conversation. There's, there's some, some experience and wisdom. But of course, if... Our, our elders who have, who have struggled with some of this stuff 
are not enough in proximity to the young folk who are asking these questions. Or if we're not talking with each other because we're seeing it just slightly differently. Um, then of course, um, the, the wisdom is going to be of little effect and, and the activists are going to be orphaned. Uh, so this is a time for us to rebuild an intergenerational movement. Um, and uh, I know that's happening, and it's got to happen even more robustly and more intentionally um, across all the ways in which our movements are balkanized. Race, and class, age, and geography, um, constituencies, issues, this is a time to reweave the fabric of life, and that means some of us are going to have to get way outside our comfort zones, but also bring the best of what we bring, uh, because we need it all. Um, and I really appreciate the, the honesty and the, and the commitment to continue to have this conversation yet again, because it wears you out. 50 years later, we're still talking about these apocalyptic horsemen. And it's worse than ever. And, <clears throat> and here we are, this family, having this conversation with each other. Let's listen. And let's act together. And let's rebuild this community across all of these lines. Uh, so again, special welcome, Shane, to you, because you bring um, greetings, I know, from whole other parts of the movement. Um, and we're really glad to have you in the mix. Um, so I want to throw it back to um, the, I guess, the, the dinner crew because... I'm happy to take credit for it. I did nothing, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yes, I prepared it all pretty well. The dinner, the dinner crew <laughs> determines the grace, is, is yeah. what I'm understanding yeah. here. So. Would you mind to grab them? Yeah. Why don't you grab them and we'll have a grace. Um, why don't you all give yourselves a little love for the hard work today? We'll keep going tomorrow. So, but tonight, the talent show. <laughs> Thank you.